Let us pray. O sovereign God who rules over all of the nations, we come and we bow before you this morning, giving thanks that you truly do rule in heaven and by your most holy, wise, and powerful work, you preserve and govern all your creatures and all your actions. O Lord, we pray in thanksgiving, and we give you thanks especially for those whom you have used providentially to preserve our liberties and freedoms. Those who have served in the armed forces, those who have served at home. We give you thanks for their lives and especially those who have given the last full measure. Lord God, we pray that you would help us, you would forgive us for lack of thankfulness and that you would enable us and to use the freedoms that you have given us to full advantage. We thank you that because of these sacrifices, we yet have the freedom to gather and worship as we are doing this morning without fear of being molested or opposed by the authorities. Oh Lord, we pray that you would long cause that to continue, but we pray that with the freedom we have now, that we would take full advantage and would worship you with fullness of heart and mind and body and soul. Hear us, Lord, as we pray and fill our hearts with thankfulness at this time. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to take just a moment to prepare our hearts for worship, and then I'll call us to worship as usual. Let's prepare. Would you please stand with me? I'm going to call us to worship uh, from the words of Psalm 34, portions of that psalm. Remember, this is God himself calling you. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Let's pray in response to God's call. O Lord, our God, our sovereign, mighty King, our loving Redeemer, we come and we bow before you this morning, and we ask for the grace and strength to hear your call and respond in obedience, to taste and see that you are good. You have encouraged us that 
when we come and we entrust ourselves to you, that we shall not lack any good thing. Oh, help us that we might do that this morning, and in doing that, prove you to be faithful to your word, as you always are. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, please take your psalters and turn with me to Psalm 113. Psalm 113, that's in the blue box, and it can be found on page 151. Page 151. Amen. It's right that we praise the Lord in response to his call. It's also right that we come and we confess our sins as we come to worship. It's a reminder week by week that we are in desperate need of his grace. So let's pray together as I lead us, but as we all confess together in our hearts. Let's pray. O sovereign, mighty God, you are the God who has made us and given us the very breath that we live by this very moment. Everything that we have and are has come from you. And to you we owe worship in times like this and throughout all our lives. You are to be the great priority of our lives. And yet, O Lord God, we confess to you this morning 
And that so often, even this week, there have been other things that have slipped into that place. We have seen it in the ways that our hearts have become worried over things. We have seen it in the way that our anger has flared up when those misplaced priorities are touched by those around us and endangered. O oh Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for putting even good things above the best thing, which is you. Help us to see the folly of this. Help us to mourn over it so that we would more and more turn from misplacing our priorities and would steadily keep you fully fixed on the throne of our hearts. We confess that too often we have sought control over our circumstances. We have felt threatened when things are beyond our ability, we feel, to manage and we don't know how things are going to work out or other people aren't acting in the way that we want them to act. And we have sought to reach out our hand and to take control rather than to go to prayer, rather than to entrust these things to you. Oh Lord, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us for, in our puny strength, seeking to do what you alone, as the almighty sovereign of the universe, can do? Oh Lord, would you enable us to turn from these things and to trust more fully in your sovereign and good care? We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior and the mediator between God and man. Amen. The scriptures remind us, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That is the promise to those who truly come confessing their sins unto God, a promise that is secured for us by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having confessed our sin, we now with full hearts can reaffirm the faith that we hold together. We're going to do that this morning from the Nicene Creed, an ancient uh, summary of biblical truth that the church has confessed for thousands of years. So let us uh, stand together and uh, we will say these things in unison. O oh, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, please be seated. Would the collection please be brought forward? Let's pray together. O Lord, we send unto you these tithes and offerings. We ask that they would be used for the building up of your kingdom. And Lord God, that you would more and more make us a people who are cheerful with our giving. That we as we are able, according to uh, the ability that you have given us, whether it be small or great, uh, that we would give unto your service, not grudgingly, not as a matter of course, but cheerfully, uh, seeking to support in this very practical way uh, your work in this world. We also pray, Lord God, for the needs of our own congregation and your people whom we are connected with and this world. Lord, we do pray for the leaders that you have sent over us. We pray that you would be at work in our King, that you would convert him as we often pray. This is not too difficult for you. And we know that you have set even around him some who truly know you and are those who would hold the faith and sincerity. Lord, give them opportunity and open up the heart of our King that he might be used mightily by you to protect and build up the church. We pray regardless of this, that you would use him to encourage righteousness and to restrain evil. And we pray indeed for his government, that you would give them wisdom, that perhaps even despite themselves, that they would do those things which would reward the good and punish the evil. We pray for our brothers and sisters, at the Christian Institute, who are so involved in this work of encouraging government to follow your ways and in protecting the the church. And we pray that you would strengthen them, that you would give success to their efforts and that you would give them joy in what can often be a thankless and grinding task. Lord God, we also turn to the needs of those whom we are connected in our wider communion. Lord, we pray particularly for Marcus Hobson and his son Edward. Oh Lord, would you comfort them in the loss of their wife and mother so, so suddenly? Would you comfort them as only you can? And would you put around them those who would sit with them and weep, would provide practically for them, would help them at this extremely difficult time. Lord, would you assure them that you are with them? And Lord, would you help them to to look to you even amidst the acute pain that they are feeling? and perhaps even the numbness and, and confusion at this time. Lord, we also pray for our sister Tracy Holding. We pray that you would comfort her in the, the loss of her father, particularly as there is no certainty where he is with you. And Lord, we pray also that you would give much effectiveness to the treatment that she'll be receiving and 
that you would cause her to draw near to you in this most difficult time. We pray for our sister Irene, and Lord, we pray that um, you would care for her, even in the confusion of her mind. Uh, we thank you that she's going to move to a different floor that will be um, able to care for her more fully, and we pray that that would be a blessing to her. We pray for Christine and John as they love her and, and care for her uh, in the midst of of her confusion and weakness. Lord, we pray that you would be with all of us. Uh, we face indwelling sin. We face discouragements. We face trials uh, that seem not to go away. And Lord, each one of us will come this morning with various needs on our minds. Would you hear us as we pray to you, that you would care for us and guide us and protect us. Lord, there is amongst us thanksgivings, ways that you have shown yourself to be faithful, ways you've provided for us. Oh Lord, would you hear us as we give thanks for these things? And would you help us to remember and to be a thankful people? Oh Lord, we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, please take your Psalters again, and this time turn with me to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, and this can be found on page 135 in the Blue Sing Psalms books page 135. This is our consecutive psalm, but it's a wonderful psalm celebrating the grace and goodness of our God. So let's sing it together with full heart. Psalm 103, and we're singing the whole psalm.
as we continue to move closer to the high point of our service and the preaching of God's word. We're going to read Luke chapter 15. And this is the reading that complements the sermon text. And I would invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and chapter 15. This is one of the most wonderful chapters of Scripture. It shows us the glorious uh, heart of God for his people. But before we do that, let's keep the two-minute silence. Stand, please. Thank you. Well, would you please um, take up your copy of Scripture if you have one and turn with me to Luke chapter 15. As I was saying, this is one of the most beautiful chapters of Scripture because it shows us the heart of God, the heart of God which uh, seeks after those who are running from him and seeks to recover them. We'll see something of that later in our service in the book of Ruth. But for now, let's give our attention to God's holy word in Luke chapter 15. I'll begin in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, that's Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A certain man who had two sons, 
And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered together all, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your servant or son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older brother was in the field, and as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might be make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Would you uh, take up your hymnals this time? Uh, That's the uh, white and yellow books. And we're going to turn together to hymn number 105. Hymn number 105. And five, the hymn is God moves in a mysterious way. It reminds us that God is always working for our good, even through the hardest difficulties. But we don't always know um, what he'll bring out of it. We don't always know the good that he's bringing. And yet we can have this sure confidence in our good God. So let's sing together. Hymn number 105.
Would you pray with me as we come to the reading and preaching of God's word? O oh Lord, we come now to the high point of our service where we hear your voice. We pray that you would use my words, but that they would not be my words, but that your spirit would use them to illumine your truth, to point to your Son, to glorify your great name, and that in seeing you, we would be convicted and comforted and fed and established. O Lord, deal with us according to your wise will and speak to us as we have need. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please turn with me in Scripture to the book of Ruth. This wonderful little book sandwiched between the book of Judges and the book of First Samuel. We began this book last week and we considered that it is really a celebration of redemption. We're going to continue on uh, and our portion this morning will be uh, verses 6 of chapter 1 to the end of chapter 1 at uh, verse 22. I'm going to read the whole chapter for context. Let's hear now God's holy word. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Mahlon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malhan and Chilion also died. So the woman survived, her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law, that they might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. And therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope. If I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they are grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her, and she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. So last week, we left Naomi alone in Moab. There were hard times in Bethlehem, we saw. That was where Elimelech and his family were from. There was instability and famine. These hard times weren't random. God had brought them as discipline for his people because of their sin. But we saw that Elimelech, whose name means my God is king, rather than responding to that discipline in repentance, had gone his own way. He had not trusted God to provide for him and his family, but had wandered away. He went to Moab where God had said not to go. He reasoned in a worldly way. Yes, the Moabites were God's enemies, and he wasn't supposed to mix with them, but they had bread. At least he could provide for his family in Moab, or so he thought. So he went to Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. And it was a disaster. He died there. His two sons married Moabite women, and then they too died. And these three women were left. In particular, Naomi was left. That's what the text emphasizes for us. She was left alone without any support. And this morning, we're going to pick up from there in the second half of the chapter. And we're going to see how into this dark, difficult situation, God intervenes. I want you to see how God intervenes and how these three women respond. In essence, I want to show you that God returns wanderers. God returns wanderers. That's the core of what I want to show you. And that is something that is worth celebrating. Wherever you are in your life, in your spiritual journey, that is a truth that is worth celebrating, that God returns wanderers. But I also want to challenge you with the responses of these three women, the responses of these three women to God's work. They lived thousands of years ago, I know, but God still works in the same way as he was working when he worked with them. And you and I still respond in the same way that they did. Maybe God is at work in your life this morning to draw you to himself or to return you to himself. Maybe that's from outside of his people. You've never been a Christian before and and he's drawing you in. Or maybe you've been here all along and yet secretly nursing rebellion against him. This passage shows you the right way and the wrong way to respond to his work in your life. Or maybe God has been drawing you, you have accepted that, but you're having second thoughts. Well, this passage 
challenges you also in those second thoughts. This morning, I want to show you first that God is at work here. That's my first point, God at work. And then my next three points are about the responses of these three women. Returning back, returning in faith, and returning in bitterness. So my title overall is God Returns Wanderers, and my points are God at Work, Returning Back, Returning in Faith, and Returning in Bitterness. There are two key words, really, in this passage. The one is walk, or in the Hebrew, halak, and the other is return, or in the Hebrew, shuv. The most dominant one is, is that word return. It's translated return several times in the English and, and other ways as well. You find it in the Hebrew 10 times in verses 6 to 22. And what these words are s- stressing is, first of all, continuous action, this walking, and then in a particular direction. Uh, so uh, walking in returning. And they're appropriate for a passage which is set in a return journey. This passage is about the direction of our lives. Just as the journey out to Moab wasn't spiritually neutral, so this return journey has much to teach us spiritually. And to begin with, we need to see that God was at work. Look with me at verse 6. Then she arose, this is Naomi, with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Now it might look like this is Naomi's initiative, but look close with me at the text. Her work is in response to God's work. That's what we see. We see here, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. God had taken away bread from the house of bread, from Bethlehem. That's what it means, the house of bread. And we saw that last week. We saw that was because of his people's sin. He had taken bread away, and now he's giving it back. And that moved Naomi from Moab. For Naomi at this point, though, the emphasis really is still on bread. If you hear the phrase that I just said, God had taken away bread and now he's giving it back, for her the emphasis is still really on the bread. I don't think that this return yet shows a spiritual change in the heart of Naomi. As one commentator put it, it, Naomi was not broken and repentant over her Moabite experience. In a moment, we're going to see her arguing in the same worldly way to her daughters-in-law that her and her husband had probably argued to go to Moab in the first place. And here, she's drawn back to Bethlehem by bread again. She's still chasing bread. Naomi's heart was still in rebellion. But God acted. God acted, and that got her on her feet, and it got her moving back towards where he wanted her to be. It's very possible that there had been repentance in Bethlehem. In fact, that's probably the case. And so that's part of the reason why God brought bread back there. There are all sorts of reasons why God may have brought bread back to Bethlehem, some of which we know and some of which we don't know. But one of those reasons, in the grand scheme of all that God was doing at that moment in history, one of the reasons why he brought bread back to Bethlehem was to get Naomi where he wanted her to be. 
So we see that God is at work. And Naomi recognizes this to some extent too. In verse 21, we read, and we'll come back to this, but for now we read, I went out full, this is Naomi speaking, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. The Lord has returned me, she says. God is at work here, providentially through his most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. God was doing something. Ruth and Naomi didn't fully understand what God was doing. In fact, as we'll see, Naomi positively misunderstood what God was doing, but God was at work. And the thing is that God has not ceased to work. God is just as much at work today in Newcastle in 2022 as he was in Moab and Bethlehem back there thousands of years ago. In the circumstances of your life, he is at work. In the world all around you, he is at work. He is at work in and through everything that is going on for his purposes. He's at work in the cost of living crisis. He's at work in friendships that you make or lose. He's at work in hard things that happen to you or in, that happen to friends around you. God is at work in and through these things for his purposes and ultimately to bring his people to himself in conversion and ultimately to fully perfect them and to bring them to himself in glory. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is at work in everything around you? Do you believe that there is no such thing as chance? That there is no such thing as fate? That God is at work in everything for his good purposes and that his people are at the center of those good purposes. You may not fully understand what he is up to, particularly if you're going through very difficult things. You may positively misunderstand what he's up to. We don't need to know everything, but we do need to carefully consider how we will respond to his work. And the rest of this passage is about the responses of three women, Orpah, Ruth, and Naomi. I first want to look at the response of Orpah under the title, Returning Back. We see here very clearly in this passage that three women left Moab. So in verse 6, then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. Verse 7, therefore she went out from the place where she was her, uh, sorry, and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So all three of them are going, they start out from Moab and they go to go back to Bethlehem. But only two, Naomi and Ruth, make it to Bethlehem. What happened? Well, the answer is a little surprising if we think about it. Orpah didn't die. She didn't have an accident. We don't even know that she lost heart or maybe she just got tired of walking. None of those things is flagged up to us in the text. What is, though, is that Naomi convinced her to return. That's right. Naomi convinced her to return. In fact, if it had been up to Naomi, both Ruth and Orpah would have gone back to Moab and to the God of Moab. 
the force that Naomi marshals to get them to return back to Moab is (laughs) striking. She presses them to return back to Moab. She tells them in verse eight and nine, when they insist on going with her, she tries to argue them out of it. Verses 11 to 13. Perhaps Naomi was reluctant to return to Bethlehem with these two embarrassing appendages. They would be a reminder of her and her husband's sin. They wouldn't be particularly welcome in the place of Bethlehem. Maybe she thought that there would just be two more mouths to feed. We don't know. But certainly, she's still prioritizing worldly well-being over spiritual well-being. Her reasoning basically comes down to this. Your future, Orpah and Ruth, is in remarrying, is in getting a husband, having children that will bring joy into your life. You'll take care of them. And then in your old age, they'll be able to take care of of you. And there's no way you're going to get that if you come back with me. She appeals to their own natural desire for well-being. She says, why will you go with me? What will that accomplish, basically? What are you going to achieve by doing this? Then she seems to draw alongside them and in effect, in effect say, I know that it's hard, but believe me, this is best. And ultimately, she blames God for the situation that we, they all find themselves in. She says, no, return back, get married, enjoy a full and happy life. That is better for you. And ultimately, Orpah succumbs to that. But I want you to see that Orpah is not necessarily an easy quitter. Orpah weeps alongside Ruth when Naomi first tells them to go back. She joins Ruth in contradicting Naomi and saying, no, we're going to go back to Bethlehem with you. But when Naomi spells out the worldly loss that that will mean, opposed to the worldly gain of going back to Moab, ultimately she succumbs. Despite her good intentions, despite her earlier resolve to leave Moab and Moab's God, she turns back. And this happens all the time in the church, sadly. People return back to the world. Those of you who've been around here for some years will be able to now think of names in your mind, people who've been amongst us, people who've even come into membership, and yet at some point they have turned back to the world from which they came. Why? Ultimately, because that was their first love. Their priority was a safe and comfortable life rather than seeking God through Jesus Christ no matter what the cost and seeking God through Jesus Christ among his people. We know that God always completes the work that he starts We know that if God is truly at work in someone, that they can never be separated from his love or snatched out of the hand of Christ. But it is possible to intend to leave behind the world and come unto Christ and and follow after him and to then at some point turn back. It shows that God was never at work really in you in the first place. But it is possible and it is a sobering warning for us. Don't turn back to Moab. Don't return back 
to a lack of love for Christ, to the thinking of this world, to the living by the attitudes of this world. Keep going. Even if you have failed this week, even if you have been cast down and, and, you, and you feel like you're down and out, get back up by the grace of God and keep going. Just keep stumbling on. And that's, that is a message to all of us because as Peter Naylor was saying yesterday in the vestry, the Christian life is one of continuing daily in faith, continuing daily in repentance, continuing daily in good works. We could say of love for God and his Christ. It is continuing, persevering in these things. And so this is a call not only to those of us who think we might be on the verge of turning back, to, but to all of us to keep going, to day in and day out, keep going. It's a reminder that fading as the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. There's also a warning here for all of us to be careful what we're encouraging people in. You know, Naomi was one of God's people, and yet extraordinarily, she encouraged Orpah to go back, to go back to Moab and to her gods. Now, I very much doubt that any of us here will be saying to those around us, you know, you really ought to leave the church. I, I very much doubt that. But there are various ways of doing that. And one of the most powerful and subtle ways is by living our own lives for the priorities of the world rather than putting Christ at the center of our lives. And those around us can see and hear loud and clear what we're saying if we're living for this world rather than Christ. And so it's an encouragement to us to be encouraging others on towards Christ rather than even by the misplaced priorities of our own life to be encouraging them away from him. So we see that Orpah returned back and we see the warnings there for us. But then we also see that Ruth responded to God's work in this situation as he was returning Naomi back to Bethlehem. And she returned in faith. We see the basic distinction, the basic contrast between Orpah and Ruth in verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. But Ruth clung to her. This word cling is the same word that's used in Genesis 2 of a man leaving his father and mother and cleaving to his wife. One commentator writes, it requires leaving membership in one group to join another. Thus, Ruth's gesture signaled her commitment to abandon her Moabite roots to remain with Naomi permanently. Now, Naomi makes a last-ditch attempt to persuade Ruth to go back to Moab. And she uses Orpah as an example. She says in verse 15, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And then we have Ruth's beautiful response. And, and what it is, is basically a spelling out of what that clinging means. It's a spelling out of the fact that she is leaving where she came from and, and she wants, whatever the cost, to go back with Naomi and ultimately to cling to Naomi's God. Listen, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you 
or to turn back from following after you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. She's committing totally. She's committing forever. Even past Naomi's death. Do you notice that? She says, where you're buried, I will be buried. That might have involved years after Naomi's death. And she's taking on her lips the covenant name of God, the Lord do so to me. There is here wonderful and beautiful commitment on a human level. I mean, wouldn't you want someone to commit to you like uh, Ruth does to Naomi here? I mean, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. But I think there's much more going on here. She says, your God will be my God. Again, she's committing after Naomi's death. She's saying she wants to be buried in Judah and in the ancient world, there was a connection with where you were buried and the gods that you served. And then also in chapter two, Boaz says of her, the Lord repay your work and full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. He had heard on the grapevine why she'd come back and it was ultimately for the Lord. Ruth loved Naomi, really and truly, and we'll see that again and again in this book. But the one she was really clinging to was Naomi's God. And this is why Naomi's arguments about worldly priorities didn't have any weight with her. She wanted to leave Moab and to cling to Naomi because that was her only connection to Naomi's God. This is quite extraordinary if you think about it. The family of Elimelech hardly were a shining example of Israelite piety, right? <laughs> they, they had gone to Moab when they, they shouldn't have done. And we would hardly give Naomi an A star for her evangelism, right? I mean, she's there encouraging them at all costs, it seems like, to go back to Moab. But the fact was that Ruth wanted to cling to her God. It seems that Naomi and her family had still been worshiping God. Uh, she uses God's name and her blessing, even if it's a bit confused, blessing them as they go back to Moab. And maybe they had told Ruth about the God who had called Abraham out of Ur of Chaldeans and promised to bless all the nations through him and his seed. Maybe they had told her about the God who had heard the cries of his people in Egypt and had shown his mighty power to overcome the superpower of that time and to redeem them out of the land of Egypt. Rahab, the prostitute of Jericho, was the mother of Boaz, who was, as we'll see, part of the larger family of Elimelech. Maybe they had told her her story and she'd seen a foreign woman's example who had staked everything on the God of Israel and had been brought in and richly rewarded for that. Whatever the reason, Ruth wanted this almighty, uncontrollable, gracious, kind, welcoming God to be her God. She wanted to leave Moab and its ways and its God, and she wanted to cling to the true and living God, and so she clung to Naomi. This is what we call in theological terms repentance and faith. Repentance, a turning away from 
this world and its ways and its thinking and rebellion against God and a turning unto God in faith uh, and entrusting oneself fully and wholly to God, repentance and faith. Our doctrinal standard, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was written by a bunch of ministers in London a few hundred years ago, it says, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, that is being made right with God, sanctification, that's being practically made more like Jesus Christ and his perfect life, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. It was this accepting and receiving and resting upon the one and true living God that Ruth was doing. Now, Naomi, a type or representation of Christ, not by a long shot, but she was Ruth's only connection to Yahweh, the one and only true and living God. And so Ruth clung to her. Does this seem excessive? Does this seem foolish? Does this seem reckless? I mean, think about it. Ruth was a Moabite woman, and Moabite women weren't acceptable in Bethlehem. She had the rest of her life ahead of her. Why throw it all away? Why put herself through such discomfort, such need, such danger, such possible rejection? Why stick with someone who didn't even want her? What was Naomi's response to her beautiful speech? Silence. No gratefulness. Why stick with someone who didn't even want her? Why leave safe, familiar Moab, the support of friends and family for the unfamiliar and the unknown? It was because she had to have Israel's God. And I think there's something that we can't fully explain about that. I think there's something supernatural about that. That God was doing something in the life of Ruth that she just had to do this. Maybe she didn't even fully understand what was going on inside of her herself, but she knew that she had to cling to Israel's God. That's what it looks like to have true saving faith. Are you here this morning and you're interested in Christianity? That's good. But more than that, what you need is this compulsion, this understanding that you have no hope apart from Jesus Christ. To know that this world has nothing for you and that you must leave it. It, You need to plead with God to give you that compulsion that Ruth had. I must have Jesus Christ. No matter the recklessness on human terms, no matter what the cost, I must have Jesus Christ. That's something only God can do in you. That's something only the Holy Spirit can work in you. Plead with him that he would give that to you. Christians, do you have that compulsion day in and day out? Pray that God would, would stir it up and, in, and encourage you in it. That, that you know that, that, that there's nothing for you in this world and that whatever else happens that day, you must have Christ. Also, maybe some of you are looking at Naomi and her evangelism and saying, yeah, I kind of think that's like my evangelism. <laughs> I, I'm not so good at encouraging people to Christ. In fact, maybe sometimes I'm a bit ashamed of him and I, I discourage people. No, I'm not encouraging you to be 
discouraging people away from Christ. But take this little comfort from this story that even despite Naomi pushing Ruth as hard as she could back to Moab, God still brought Ruth in supernaturally. And if God can do that, God can use your poor, weak, faltering evangelism to return those who are lost in darkness and rebellion to him in faith. What we see here is Ruth returning in faith. But then we need to look at Naomi. She returned in bitterness. Now, I've already said that I don't think her heart was soft to the Lord at this point. She was really just returning to Bethlehem because there was bread again. The old worldly priorities were still uppermost for her. We've seen that in the way she's arguing with her daughters-in-law. But now, in the last part of this chapter, we see something added. Anger and bitterness towards God. We saw something of that on the road from Moab. Verse 13, the Lord has gone out against me. She says, I've lost everything. I've lost my husband, my children, my security, my future, my host. I lost everything. And this is God's fault. When we see her stumbling, as it were, back into Bethlehem, the ladies of the town, they say, is this Naomi? The implication is that there's been a dramatic change in her. Remember, her name means pleasant. It would seem that the years and the suffering have taken their toll. She puts it like this. Verse 20, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Mara means bitter. She wants to be called bitter because she is bitter, bitter with God and perhaps with others as well. She makes no secret of her bitterness towards God. The Lord has testified against me, she says. I went out full and the Lord has brought me back empty. My translation of that is, I was full when I walked out and empty Yahweh has returned me. You know, Naomi can see the sovereignty of God. Naomi can see crystal clear the sovereignty of God. She knows that God is in control of all things. He has brought this suffering into her life. However, she can't see anything good in it. She can't see the goodness of God. It's not even clear that she recognizes her sin. She says, and listen to this, the Lord has testified against me. Not, it was good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 71. Her focus was all on her suffering, the suffering that she had gone through and the fact that God had brought it on her, and it made her angry, it made her bitter. To her, God is an adversary. He was against her. 
He was God. She was his child. He was almighty. He was too strong for her. She had to submit to him. But it's the sort of reluctant submission of a child who's forced resentfully to obey. In addition, her bitterness against God is robbing her of any sort of comfort. It's confusing her. This is how she could be so confused as to pray that God would bless Orpah and Ruth as they went away from God, back to Moab and and his God. It's also making her hard-hearted towards those around her. That she could hear Ruth's incredible statement of dedication to her and just remain utterly silent. In fact, at, at the that point in the passage, it says she didn't say anything more to her. And then the next thing you hear is about them going into Bethlehem. It's, of course, probably not the case that they didn't talk at all on the journey. But, but the way the passage is set up, it's almost as if they didn't talk at all the rest of the journey. The fact that she was bitter made her act so hard-heartedly towards Ruth. Some commentators think that Naomi is genuinely repentant here. They try to say that that God had emptied her of her pride by his discipline. But this isn't the testimony of someone who has submitted and learned from God's discipline. She's not saying that God was doing good things in the midst of all the hard things that he brought into her life. She's saying, I'm bitter because God is against me and God has been against me. Do you see the difference between those two things? She may have physically returned to Bethlehem, but her heart's not returned to her God. She was still a believer in modern Christian terminology, but she's estranged from God by the bitterness in her heart. She has returned in bitterness. And the same thing can happen to you and me, brothers and sisters, and that's why it's really important for us to see that Naomi got it all wrong here. God wasn't against her. And we can see that even in this passage. He had brought bread back to Bethlehem. He had brought her back to Bethlehem. He gave her an incredible daughter-in-law, even though she doesn't even recognize her as she comes back in to Bethlehem. He brought her back at a time of fullness, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Here she is with plenty all around her, plenty that God had already begun to provide for her and would even more and more provide for her. And we'll see that as we go through the book. Here she is with plenty all around her and more to come. And she says, I was full and now I was empty and it's God's fault. One of the times that Israel, her ancestors, were complaining in the wilderness, it was at a place called Mara because the water was too bitter to drink. But God made it sweet for them. And then he took them to a wonderful oasis called Elam. And God does that in our lives as well. He restores us and makes us to lie down in green pastures. Above all, he's given us his son. We deserve pain and misery. We are rebels. Naomi deserved pain and misery. She deserved to be left in Moab. But God sent his son to live to die, to rise again so that our sins might be forgiven, so that we might have 
a reconciled relationship with him. He is changing us and he is leading us into full communion with him in heaven and in the new creation. He is filling us with plenty and there is more to come, brothers and sisters. It's easy to condemn Naomi from afar, but when pain bites us in our own experiences, it's so easy to fall into the same bitterness. I think as evangelical reformed Christians, we're often very careful about not turning our bitterness on God explicitly. But we're very quick to complain and to let that complaining turn into bitterness. You know, another time that Israel in the wilderness were complaining against God, Moses called their bluff and he said, your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. That's true of us too. Our complaints are really not against our circumstances, but they're against the Lord. Bitterness is so subtle and it's a quiet killer. It often starts with real pain. That's part of what makes it so subtle, is it starts with real, often legitimate pain, but pain that's not humbly submitted to the Lord. And then it grows, often without our notice. Grows like a cancer throughout everything we do. And then bitterness blinds us to our blessings. We can have good things all around us and not be able to see them. It confuses us spiritually like it did Naomi. It makes us hard-hearted towards those around us. How are you responding to God's work in your life? Particularly in his painful providences. Are you humbly submitting your pain to him? Are you relying on his grace when it seems too much for you? Seeking to learn what he is teaching you, remembering that he is for you even in the midst of all that pain. More than that, are you seeking grace? Are you seeking grace to lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes from your heart of pain to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the immeasurable love of God which he has shown to you if you are in Christ by sending his son through his death and through his resurrection? Naomi knew nothing of what God was about to do for her. We know something about what God is doing for us in Christ, but in many practical ways, we often don't know the blessings that are just around the corner for us. It may be that if you are in the midst of a painful situation like Naomi, that God is bringing blessing into your life, blessing that your bitterness is blinding you to. It may be that even now, that God has started that work. But whatever the circumstances, whether that's true or not, you know that bitterness, that pain will not be the end for you because God is at work. He has joined you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is making you like him and he is bringing you to himself in heaven and ultimately to his new creation. Naomi returned in bitterness Brothers and sisters, we don't have to. This passage shows us that God was at work in the lives of Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth. He was at work returning, wandering Naomi back to the land of promise. He was giving a wandering Moabitess faith and repentance. God returns wanderers. He seeks and saves the lost. Even when they're difficult and bitter, like Naomi. Even when they're enemies of God, like Ruth. And he's doing that right here, right now, 
in Newcastle. Maybe he's doing it in your life, either for the first time or to draw you back out of bitterness, to return you to a fuller sense of communion with himself. The fact that this is who our God is, that he is a God who returns wanderers, who has love and, and grace for them, is something we should celebrate. I want you to go from this morning with a new sense of God's goodness to those who've wandered from him. That's what we're seeing in this passage. Glory in that. Rejoice in that, brothers and sisters. But I also want you to consider and seriously consider how are you responding to God's work in your life? Orpah returned back. Ruth returned in faith. Naomi returned in bitterness. Where are you? Pray to God. Pray to God that he would day by day give you that supernatural compulsion to say I must have Christ whatever else that you would day by day like Ruth return in repentance and faith to him that you would not turn back like Orpah a return but in bitterness like Naomi, but would return in faith like Ruth. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we praise you that you're a God who returns wonders. What an amazing thing. We don't deserve it. None of us here deserve your goodness and your grace unto us but you've returned each one of those who is joined under your son this morning. Perhaps you're working in others who haven't yet returned, those who've grown up in a Christian family but don't really know Christ, those who are on the fringes. Lord, would you give them, would you give all of us each day a compulsion to have Christ, whatever that means. Lord, save us from turning back to this world. Save us from bitterness. And if we find ourselves in bitterness, oh Lord, comfort us that you will deal with us patiently and gently just like you dealt with Naomi. We ask these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing now a w- wonderful hymn, hymn number 803, O love that will not let me go. Just as God's love would not let Naomi go, so it will not let us go if we are his own through Jesus Christ. Let's sing together, O love that will not let me go.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.